going into my inlet of my lift pump. And I'll tell you what, if that don't look like a bunch of algae and crap on some kind of screen, I don't know what does. I am super excited to see that. Super excited. All right, so how do I get that out of there? Oh yeah, look at that, look, oh. look. Hey guys, Scanner Danner here with my son, Caleb Danner. He is normally cameraman and behind the camera, but on this one- In front of it today. He's in front of it, because we're gonna go over this RV injection system together. I wanna teach him a little bit of stuff and uh, uh, obviously teach you guys as well. You RV guys that are finding me on this video, because I'm gonna tag this with what this is, you definitely wanna pay attention to me here because what we're talking about is a huge, huge problem in, in the field. As I did researches on this problem, uh, people were getting um, $8,000 repair bills from garages that were changing the CAPS injection pump and it was not the problem. Okay, so my RV, it's a 2001 uh, CAPS injection system, which is a uh, Cummins accumulator pump system, and it is the 8.3. So the ISC 8.3, C being the 8.3, from the research I've done, B is the 5.9 Cummins. That's just a Google search, uh, don't hold me to that. But this is the 8.3 ISC, and the issue I had with this RV was a low power condition, intermittent stall, and no start, and Honestly guys, um, it was totally fine throughout the summer and I store it in a limestone mine um, for the winter and it was probably October uh, or early November here in, in Pennsylvania, we're in the Pittsburgh area. I think maybe some snow flurries were, were flying that day and I, I got in the RV, taking it to the mines. The RV started to shake violently on me when I was into the throttle. The yellow check engine light came on and the red stop engine light both came on. They were flashing on and off as I was into it, mm. surging bucking. And uh, it only it did it a few times and I was like, ah, oh, well, I hope I can make it to the mine. I'll worry about this in, in the spring, you know, when I get it back home. So we're driving and um, it does it again a few more times. I'm starting to get nervous. I come down to a main intersection getting ready to merge onto the highway. I'm sitting at a red light. I give it gas to go through the light and it dies right in the middle of the intersection. Crank, 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 won't start. Crank, 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 won't start. Fortunately, I have enough momentum that I throw it in neutral um, and I cut this guy off and he's on the horn, he's, he's mad at me. <laughs> But I'm, I'm not going to stop. You know, yeah. In my mind, I'm like, you better move because I'm not stopping. Because if I stop, I'm, I'm going to screw everyone. Yeah. You know, you break down in a 40-foot bus, it's a lot different than when you're in a car. Yeah. You get out of a car and push it off to the side of the road, you're in a 40-foot bus. Uh, not fun. So I have some footage of this coming up. You guys will see it. But for you RV guys, I want to I want to get to the point here quickly so you can have something to go by for yourself because I understand completely that um, the situations arise where you're stuck. You need an answer now. And also for you guys that are about to take maybe your rig to the shop and a dealer is telling you to change the, the caps injection pump, uh, you might want to hold off on that because you might not need one. Um, I can't tell you how many posts I found researching this system that these people were charged upwards of $8,000 for a new caps injection pump for this problem and it didn't fix it, didn't fix it. Um, so uh, crazy stuff with this, um, ultimately what it is, this is the inside of the transfer pump that leads from the tank to the uh, caps injection system. Such a crazy picture. Um, this is algae. It's, a, it's an algae buildup on the transfer pump inlet. And that was after I put a tool in there and moved it around. I'm like, what am I looking at? <laughs> what is that? It, it's algae. That was, it grew around that area. That's so crazy. Yeah. And so a couple of warnings if, in case I forget, when you have algae like this on the inlet of the transfer pump, uh, that can mean that your tank is full of algae. So as we go through the rest of this video, stay with me. You guys that are stuck on the side of the road, you can go ahead and skip around and find out where this is because 
we're gonna go through where that pump is, how to clean it out. Uh, we're gonna go through the false trouble codes that this had. This thing had engine speed sensor fault codes to the point where I cleared the fault codes, had the RV running in my driveway when I finally got it back home. I milked it home, had it running in my driveway, had a friend come over with a scan tool, cleared the fault codes, started it back up, and the only codes that came back were engine speed sensor fault codes. Guys, they were false trouble codes. Crazy. Stay with me here, stay with me here. False trouble codes, gonna lead you on a wild goose chase. And then following the order of the other fault codes, going on all the forums, they're gonna have you changing this caps injection pump. And uh, again, you're not gonna fix it. So that's the inlet of the transfer pump. Uh, for you R RV guys, I'll give you one more piece before we go through this thing. The inlet of the transfer pump. So transfer or lift pump is the name of it. This is a picture from Cummins and I've marked the line. So the, the inlet line right here, the inlet line for the transfer pump right underneath this second bolt is that uh, check valve. Some people call this a, a screen. Um, it is not a screen. Uh, it's almost like a, like a drain capture, like it's in your shower, but it's not really a screen. Um, and that was after we cleaned it. And, and you can see underneath our screen, if you want to call it, there's like a black colored piece in there. And you're going to see later in the video when I'm poking in there that it actually moves. That is your check valve. Oh. That's a check valve. So when the transfer pump's running, fuel's being drawn in. And when the transfer pump shuts off or the engine shuts off, it keeps fuel from running back to the tank. And we'll, we'll talk about how that algae can grow here too. And this is the key picture. When you shut the engine off, this is what you're going to see in that line. Mm -hmm. You see an area where there's no fuel. Guess what can grow right there? Ultimately for mine, mm -hmm. my tank was fine. I used an inspection camera, got lucky, right? But that stuff there, it's the only spot that it grew. But this is legit guys, a zero cost fix. If you've watched this far and you, you care to watch some more, please do. We're going to go through each step that we went through, including the uh, actual um, troubleshooting diagnosis. All right. So let me, let me give you a history again. Uh, my son, Bo and I are driving to the mines. You know, like I said earlier, it starts surging, bucking, it stalled on us, wouldn't restart. I pulled over and I shut the key off and waited. And I, th I believe this is the key because the transfer pump will not re-energize the lift pump transfer pump will not re-energize until you turn the key off. Okay. and turn the key back on. And when I did that, um, it started back up. So that was enough, in my opinion, to force enough fuel through that algae or make it move out of the way that now it started back up. And then I milked it back home. I, I, and I recognized if I stayed out of the throttle, I could drive it. All right, Bo, you think we'll make this hill? What do you think? If I stay out of the throttle. Oh, there it is. Absolutely feels like low, low fuel on a gasoline engine, Bo. Like a fuel pump that's failing. Yes. Just want to get in my driveway. To me, in a car, that's weird. It's starving for fuel. If you got a fuel pump that's failing on a car, and you you heavy throttle, heavy foot it, you're gonna have issues. Mm -hmm. Light throttle, you're not. So it acted just like that. Got it back to the driveway, <clears throat> had no idea where I was going with it. And it sat there for two months before the initial diagnosis. So now it's sitting in the driveway. Two months later, it's now January and it's cold as balls. And I let it sit because I knew the check engine light was on and I knew it would store trouble codes just like a car. I have a friend of mine that works for um, uh, Port Authority, which is a, a bus system in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And he works on diesel engines and he brought one of his scan tools over the, the RV wouldn't start. Uh, we cranked it over, cranked it over. It's not starting. In fact, before I called him, it wasn't starting sitting in the driveway. Mm. Um, 
So it's, it's essentially a no start. And what we found is four codes in memory. Tough to see the first number because there's a, something covering it, but it was a 115, uh, a 121, uh, 329 and a 456. One of the things we do in the automotive field as far as where to start when you have multiple codes, we'll write them down, clear them, and then see, if they come see what comes back. That's where we start. And guys, the only codes that came back immediately were the engine speed sensor codes. No fuel related codes, engine speed sensor codes only. So the 115 and the 121 were the ones that came back. Something I forgot as well as the engine speed sensor codes. Um, the other thing we noticed is I had fuel leaking above the starter. And this fuel, diesel fuel, this has been there since I owned the RV. I noticed it before we took our first trip out west. We drove from PA to Utah to Arizona. That before I took it, I knew I had a, a diesel fuel leak but it only leaked first start of the day. I didn't know anything about the lift pump, transfer pump. It would not leak. You got it going, it was fine. If it was running, it did not leak a drop. Okay. And so I felt comfortable putting my family in this thing yeah. because it wasn't leaking any fuel when it was running. Gotcha. And here I find out with research, some of the stuff we're gonna talk about in here, this lift pump and what it does, right? This is the lift pump right here in this picture. Another picture there, that's it there. Sits on the side of my engine block. There's the inside of it. So with a little bit of research and help from the forum community, I found out that this lift pump will leak because the bolts loosen up. This gasket that's shown on the left picture, yeah. uh, if the bolts loosen up, what happens? You get fuel that leaks there. So the why would it stop when it's because, just heat? Good question. Um, it stops leaking there after the lift pump shuts off. So when does the lift pump run? Lift pump runs first 30 seconds when you turn oh, the key on. Gotcha. So the way this works, lift pump runs, right? Electric motors running in here mm -hmm. and it's drawing fuel from the tank on this guy. Past the check valve here that has all the algae on it. Yeah. Then moves through up to the caps injection pump, which is a mechanical pump. There's no pressure in this line, but there would be pressure. I forget what the PSI is on the lift pump. I think it's something like 15 PSI that the lift pump is providing. So this electric motor is spinning and it's forcing fuel this way. When the lift pump's running, why does it only leak? This is addressing your question. Why does it only leak when the, when the lift pump's running? Yeah. You only have pressure in here when the lift pump motor's running. When the lift pump shuts off, of course we continue to draw fuel in, but it's done There's in no a pressure. vacuum. This is now a vacuum that pulls this direction. Mm. It's basically priming the injection system and the inner workings of the whole mechanism in there, I'm not real familiar with, but mm -hmm. it's a mechanical pump that's drawing fuel and so you'll legit have vacuum there. And some of the tests, that's what you're doing here, is you're measuring the vacuum on this port, and then you're measuring the vacuum on this port as a test for whether or not you have a restriction in your lift pump. So this is really um, some of the tests that I did later on, which I didn't show, I didn't film, but I did these tests and it passed. It passed these tests. It was like a maximum of five inches of vacuum, yeah. uh, which we're gonna cover here shortly. But here's this is the answer. Why is it only leak? Again, when the lift pump's running, why did I only see the fuel on the first start of the day and then later on running, filling up at gas stations, whatever, mm -hmm. looking at the RV, looking underneath, no fuel? Because we're drawing, this is a vacuum now, yeah. around five inches at most, uh, a vacuum. And so right where this gasket is, which is gonna be a leak, where, where's this lift pump? Right above the starter, that's why I was seeing fuel there. And with it running, what's gonna happen? We're pulling fuel right from the tank. We wanna pull fuel through, depending on how bad it's leaking or how loose the bolts are, we can also pull outside air. So what happens if we're pulling air in instead of fuel? Our pressure's gonna be off, our yeah. volume's gonna be off. That's a factor as well, you guys paying attention. Okay. All I had to do to fix that, uh, just tighten the bolts. <laughs> Which bolts? I have the bolts highlighted in this picture. There's three of them, tighten them. And, and I believe that's partly why it ran better on my way to the shop. So fuel leak, transfer pump, a little bit of info on the transfer pump, what it does, a little bit of info on that check valve there too. All right, so only codes at this point. So we're up, we're up here. Only codes that showed active when we finally got this thing running. We did get it running after cranking it over. And this is before yeah. I tightened any bolts or anything. Um, I had engine speed sensor faults. So looking at scan data during the no start while cranking, we noticed no RPM signal on the scan tool. We had a crank sensor fault code and the blue line right there is my crank signal. Go ahead, do it, crank it. 
course it fired right yeah, there. Yeah, it shut off though. Yep. It, it, it quit on its own, so. Did. Mm. Why is it not start? Why did it take so long? I didn't like that. So we're cranking it over, yeah. looking at scan data and there's no RPM signal showing momentarily. And then we're like, oh, bam, that's it, right? Mm -hmm. So no RPM signal, that's why it's not starting. That's gonna make it buck and surge. Yeah. We're thinking that the other codes, the 329 and 456 codes were engine like D-rate, which is like the computer system recognizing a fault and then dialing back the fuel pressure so it prevents engine damage. And we were thinking it was cause and effect, like, speed sensors were causing these other faults. That's what our initial thoughts were going into this. And it really had to do with not seeing the RPM on the scan tool. Then we cranked it another time and it wasn't starting and we had a solid RPM signal the whole time. So it kind of shoot, shoots that theory. Mm. Anyway, here's where I'm at. It's January, it's snowing, we're outside, it's dark. My friend's gotta go back to work, take his tool with him. So what do you think I did? I, I decided to be a parts changer. I ordered two speed sensors. Did a little bit of homework, found out this engine has two speed sensors. I ordered them both. And you replaced them both? I did, well, I wanted to replace them both until I found out where they live. And where they live is in hell. So underneath the RV, we're looking at a hydraulic pump, which is the blue part right right here mm -hmm. and that was one that i did a video on uh, i'll put a link in here for you guys for this leaking hydraulic pump and then what's in front of that is the air pump so this is an air pump where it's air brakes air suspension this is my air pump and the speed sensors live above that so you either got to take these two pumps off or you go from the top which is you take the caps injection pump off to get to them and we're talking the injection pump. I did a labor time on that. I think it was like 10 hours. Oh my goodness. It's a 10 hour job to get <laughs> to get to them. This would have been a couple hours from the bottom. Yeah. And I did manage to get my camera in there. As you can see, there's my two engine speed sensors. Okay. With research, apparently they just read the same tone ring. So there's the same set of teeth, but they stagger the sensors as you can see in the picture. So they use two speed sensor signals. Uh, one is delayed from the other. And, you know, that was a really difficult shot right there to get. But there's your speed sensors. And I see three wires on there. That tells me they're probably Hall Effects digital signal, just like the cars. But back to this, I had these speed sensors and I realized what it was gonna take to change them and don't have a scan tool. And I think I'm just gonna change them. In fact, we did have it running and I was like smacking on the sensors with a long screwdriver. Couldn't get it to act up at yeah. all. It sat until uh, May. It's now May and I need to go get it inspected. And so I take the, the RV to a local shop where they inspect it for me every year. And I told them to change the speed sensors for me. I was gonna pay, <laughs> I was gonna pay the garage. I, I didn't wanna do it. I'm not pulling that stuff apart. Yeah. Um, I have enough stuff to do. And, and I, I actually told them that I, I wouldn't hold them accountable if it didn't fix it. I know I have speed sensor faults. Okay. I know I have, you yeah. know, I, I said, I want you to change these parts and I'm not gonna hold you accountable, you know? Uh, they refused to do it. They refused to do the speed sensor. So then I said, well, okay, then I will pay your diagnostic fee. You know, whatever you guys need, tell me what's wrong with this thing. If you don't wanna change the speed sensors, tell me what's wrong with okay. it. So, you know, I go, they give me a call like two weeks later. I'll come get it, it's ready to go. Like, that's not the call you expect for something like this. Yeah. I want to know what you found. Well, I get there. Yeah, it's got an inspection sticker on it. It's ready to go, all right. But they said, we couldn't get it to act up. I'm like, well, did you drive it? I'm like, did you drive it? They're like, well, no, because we didn't want to, we didn't want to break down. Well, how much sense does that make? I don't want to break down either, right? I'm like, all right, listen, if I can get this thing to act up, make yeah. this light come back on, will you, will you look at it for me? He said, sure, so I can get codes. So I go uh, literally pull out, out of the parking lot of the garage and I know it's wide open throttle, it'll do it. Mm -hmm. Hit it to the floor, immediately does it. <laughs> Falls on its face, check engine lights on. I didn't go 50 feet, that's all that's he needed funny. to do. So he, he went in, grabbed his scan tool, a little bit different format. You know, on this one, this is the um, a laptop based program, a lot better info, but with the garage that I took it to, they had this format. So this was the code that I found 
from the garage. This is after clearing the faults and then me test driving it, it came back with, uh, with this info. And I did some research on the 9410 uh, and that was plugged into service info on, on, on the Cummins program and notice the conversion. What is it? It's the 456 code, right? Um, and then I had the, uh, a little bit weird format on that one. And the best I could do with this guy was plug that in and it ended up being this guy, 329. So it took me a while to put all that together, this FMI 12 ends up being the 329 code. Yeah. 9410 ends up being my 456. So now let's go back to our faults, original faults. 329, 456, my engine speed sensor codes are gone. So at well, this point you're done looking at I'm done looking sensor. at the engine speed sensor codes. Okay, got it. In fact, I missed a part here before I took it down to the shop. I researched the engine speed sensor faults. It's a hull effect. So I should have a digital signal on this. And the only problem is I can't get to the sensor. And so I end up doing them at the computer, which is nice that they're giving me computer pin numbers. And there's, there's the, just a picture of it running me hooked up to it. Just showing the, showing the scope I'm using. It's Pico Automotive four channel piping it into my laptop, there's your engine speed sensor signals. So then my next capture, what I did is I set a really long time base mm -hmm. because I'm trying to get it to act up. I'm trying to make this thing shut down and I'm trying to prove that I'm losing engine speed sensor signals. Yeah. In fact, I think I even drove this on the way down to the garage and um, was never losing any, any signals. But I couldn't get it to act up either on the way down. And that's why I still had them. I was convinced still at that point in time, I was still convinced that I was gonna change the speed sensors first. I still have the speed sensors and they're still sitting in my RV in case I ever need them. I'm not sending them back, but they were never put in. And I put, I don't know how many miles, at least a few hundred miles on the RV this past summer. Uh, took many trips with it with no problem after cleaning out this, this uh, crap in the transfer pump or lift pump, whatever you want to call it. I do want to mention though, that when I adapted to this location, which is one of the tests that I was instructed to do um, and measure no more than 10 inches of vacuum. And if you do your fuel filters plugged, mm -hmm. I had over 120 pounds of pressure there and it blew my gauge off and I had diesel fuel squirting all <laughs> over the backyard, <laughs> stuff that would have been really oh, cool to have in the video. And the reason it did that is I, I connected to the wrong port. The port I was supposed to be connected to was this one right here, but look at it. I mean, that doesn't look like anything to me. It's got a rubber plug yeah, over right. top of it. And so once I pull that rubber plug off, that comes off. This actually unscrews. Gotcha. Um, I think it's made for like a quick coupler that you can do a measurement right there. Yeah. That was the other measurement. So mm -hmm. anyway, um, you're gonna hear my friend Brian and I talking about the test we did on the, on the um, lift pump where I measured here. So what you would do um, with the engine running, if you measure on this port and you read vacuum, mm -hmm. that's in front of the check valve. That means you have a restriction in your tank. There shouldn't be any vacuum there, none. It should be a draw from the tank. It's pulling, but there shouldn't be a vacuum. If you read vacuum on that port, you have a restriction in your tank. If you read vacuum on this port up to five inches, five inches was the most, mm -hmm. then you have a restric restriction in your check valve. And it even mentions that. It says, yeah, lift pump test. So they show the check valve as a ball. It ain't a freaking ball. It's a disc. You're gonna see that disc is gonna move when I'm cleaning this thing. It says lift pump will operate 30 to 60 seconds. Okay, when you turn the key on, it says lift pump contained is an assembly that includes a fuel supply and drain manifolds. A bypass check valve in the fuel supply manifold makes sure the system is primed by the lift pump. This check valve opens under vacuum created by the fuel injection pump once the engine is started. High vacuum measured between the electric lift pump and the fuel filter can indicate uh, the check valves become plugged. And so that's the second one. So when you do the check, there's your first one that, that, that you do, um, and it should be record inlet restriction and outlet of the lift pump. It says maximum of four inches of mercury, right? And that's on, that would be on the pump side Maximum four, I had zero. I moved over to this one up top, the second test port. You see where I'm connected down below, right? Those two ports on top. Yeah. And then the second one I moved over, that's after the check valve. Maximum of five, oh, that's outlet pressure of the lift pump, sorry. 
Okay, I said 15 PSI earlier. I was wrong. It has no maximum. No it has max a, minimum, yeah, it has of a minimum of five. That's your lift pump pressure. Okay. But I did the same check there with vacuum. I read almost four inches of vacuum at that point. So it wasn't clear on which one in this one. I think it, that you do it on both or you can. I had zero on this one connected here and I had under four on that one. So that's the inlet to the transfer pump or the lift pump or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, so that's coming straight from the tank. The, the surprising part for me is my vacuum test didn't show that. You know, the vacuum side, of the discharge side of the transfer pump, well, I would imagine it should have shown it to me. You know what, I think the issue was is you weren't under load. That no. makes sense, no, that, that makes sense. And I think it said, it, it didn't use under load, they used some weird terminology. At, at, at rated speed, uh, at, but even sometimes at rated speed isn't good enough. Yeah, gotcha. Mm -hmm. So to me, everything looked fine on my initial test. And that's when I did the test, I was trying, I was attempting to do this one. And you see where they're connected on the side of the block. They're having you hook up some goofy, you know, connection but it shows you four inches of vacuum at the OEM connection. That was on the lift pump. That was down here. That's what I assumed it to be. And then this test up here is after the filter. So here's your fuel filter. My lift pump's off the picture over here. Yeah. Your two test ports would sit on top. So measuring here at four, my next attempt was to measure over here, which is after the fuel filter, mm. a maximum of, if you have 10 maximum, that means your fuel filter's plugged. But I did change the fuel filter. So we have a new fuel filter too, and I pulled it apart. I didn't see anything inside of it. Um, that was like the first thing I did. But that was why I was attempting to connect there. And I did that test. As you can see, where am I connected? Right there. Mm -hmm. It blew my freaking line off. You see, I even clamped it because it blew it off initially. And I was like, oh, it just needs a clamp there. <laughs> no, no. I had a 15, you know, 30 PSI vacuum gauge, yeah, 30 inches of mercury and it, it blew it apart and I put my fuel pressure gauge on there, buried my fuel pressure gauge, which is 120 PSI. Wrong port, guys, I, I believe it's this one. I, I don't know that for sure. So anyway, this is just me learning the hard way how to do these tests and I was done at this point. At, at this point, I'm like, well, how can I prove where my fault is? I have no idea, I have no, I have no idea. I don't know about the check valve in the lift pump. I don't know about the algae in here yet. I'm trying to prove that I don't need uh, this CAPS injection system pump. They run from somewhere between four and $6,000 for the part yeah. alone. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, what test can I do you know, I, I did as much as I could with the information I had, and I'm like, what other tests can I do? And this is where I get on the phone with my friend Brian. No, this is where I start doing research online and seeing all these RV posts. I changed this pump, changed this pump, changed this pump, $8,000, $10,000, and it didn't fix it. And I saw yeah. one post where the guy talked about tightening the bolts, and I'm like, bingo, that's a good yeah. one. Tightened my bolts, they were loose, fixed my leak, okay. still had my issue. And then I found another post that said, check for algae in an inlet screen. <laughs> and I'm like, what is this inlet screen that yeah. we're talking about here? Because my service information doesn't talk about it. Yeah. It did mention a check valve, but this is where I'm on the forums and I'm doing research and I'm hoping I can give back to the forums and the RV community mm -hmm. with this video because this, I, I wish I, I, I would have saved those posts so I could give credit where it's due because that's, that was what first gave me this idea of this inlet screen. And guys, we fixed this thing with a pocket screwdriver, a little bit of brake clean and an air nozzle mm -hmm. and as far as the algae goes and where it grew it only grew in that location mm -hmm. i have a nice inspection camera we went in the tank nothing in the tank tank looks great so how does the algae grow there in my opinion it has the ability to grow there because when the engine shuts off where is the check valve the check valve in this picture so you're looking at liquid fuel i know it, yeah. it's kind of this is liquid fuel all in here okay this is the bottom of the line so uh, when you shut the engine off, your check valve is in here. This black yeah, disc, I see that. your check valve you is in can... there, yeah. So that closes, which traps fuel from that side up to the engine, but it lets it drain back from here to the tank. 
What do we have exposed here? Air. Mm -hmm. Granted, there's no light. How does algae grow with no light? You're asking the wrong guy. I don't know. It's a plant and it freaking grew. And how did so it grow? Crazy. It grew right there only. Yeah. It's the only spot I had it. Yeah. Crazy so stuff. Crazy. I know this was long for a help for the RV one, but guys, thanks for joining me. Ca uh, Caleb, thank you for being here with me. This is enough to get you guys back on the road. Make sure you check that screen. Not a screen. What do you call that? Drain? It's not a, what's the word for that? It's not a screen. Make sure you check that thing. Check that thing. We'll call it a screen like other people do. Okay. Check that inlet screen for algae. So we have to go up the hill, get a shot up there. Cause these construction guys. So we're going to have the biggest challenge yet. Up the hill we go. All right. It's gonna do it. It's gonna do it on this hill. This is a hell of a hill. Yeah, it is. up this hill I mean it's a pretty monster hill but I am at wide open pulling the hill no problem at all wide open the entire time no surges no hesitations okay so my final comments uh, after taking I don't know about a hundred mile trip everything is perfect no issues at all just have one more suggestion for you guys. If you run into something similar like this, don't pay to have your tank dropped right off the bat. Huge task on something like this. The gas tank is super wide. You gotta get the front end off the ground at least three feet, the wheels off the ground. And uh, I don't know how you would do that. I saw a picture of a guy doing it with a tow truck. But um, my suggestion is have somebody put an inspection camera like I used in the filler neck and take a look inside the tank. Mine was clean. So where that algae came from is up for debate. Um, definitely want to inspect your tank though. Uh, in our case, we got lucky and all we had to do is clean that inlet screen and we're good to go. Um, it's something I will keep an eye on for sure. And uh, it's definitely something that I need to consider doing is running an algicide, some type of a, of, of a fuel treatment to make sure that that doesn't happen. Also, when I store it for the winter time, make sure my tank is full, those kind of things. So we are good again with this fix. Bo, thanks for being my cameraman. He's behind the camera here now, coming back from camp with me for the weekend. Again, perfect, perfect trip. Thanks again, Bo. Thank you guys. I'll see you next time.